Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Evan. Nice to see you. How's everything? Uh, it's a crazy end of year lame duck session chaos here in the House of Representatives. We'll get through it. Uh, there's, I'm sure there's a ton on your plate um, and there's been some awesome uh, advancements lately that I'm excited to chat with you about. Uh, we've got some AI advancements, we've got some fusion advancements, and uh, with your background being what it is, I'm excited to hear your thoughts and perspectives on some of these things. Um, you're one of the only congressmen who have a background in computer engineering, uh, specifically, I think the only one with a with a degree in AI, is that right? right. As far as I know, yeah, the only only one with a graduate degree in AI. How has that served you so far uh, being in that position? And how do you see that serving our country in the future? Well, it's I, I think that to be an effective legislative body, we need people from all different walks of life with all different uh, backgrounds and uh, all different opinions. And that's uh, that all contributes to the our strength when we attempt to legislate on issues that affect the country, because uh, no one's going to be an expert on everything, right? You can try and be the Renaissance man, but uh, it's it's uh, you, you quickly understand that uh, you're doomed to failure because the issues that we deal with are so broad and so complicated. So uh, I'm very uh, happy that I'm I can bring my background in uh, both entrepreneurialism because as you know I ran a uh, started a, a video game development studio out of my dorm room at Caltech 30 years ago and ran it for 30 years. And so, uh, you know, that gives me some unique perspective on how hard it is to start a company and some of the barriers uh, that exist there and uh, the way that job growth and entrepreneurialism cat catalyzes the growth in prosperity. Um, and I also bring my perspective, obviously, as a computer science, uh, as a, a one-time academic in artificial intelligence, uh, you know, and uh, as a computer engineer to some of the really deep and uh, very technical uh, and morally thorny issues that are facing us, issues like uh, the regulation of AI, uh, issues about uh, the spread of disinformation through digital uh, media channels, issues like uh, digital privacy and uh, the pervasiveness of companies who are trying to pierce that digital veil. And you know, trying to marry that with solutions that that uh, to bring uh, some federal oversight and federal regulation to those problems. So, uh, you know, I'm happy to be able to do that, and uh, also happy that I've got colleagues here that are from other walks of life. And you know, I feel like I can be an asset to them in helping to understand some of these issues and and why they're complex and what solutions might be. And then I I lean on them to understand. Uh, issues that they might be experts at that, that uh, you know, because of their background that I'm not. So, I mean, it really is a collaborative effort. How are we doing with policy around AI in general? <laughs> well, we're behind. Uh, so Europe has taken really a leadership role in the regulation of AI, and not in entirely a good way, in my opinion. You know, they I, I think they've taken a, an overly broad and somewhat naive approach to trying to regulate AI. They want to create a system where anyone that uses AI for any commercial purpose has to submit the algorithm that they propose to use to some you know, kind of panel that will then approve or disapprove the, that use of AI. Uh, you know, and, and that just uh, it's kind of a typically European solution that says government can do everything and we're just going to empower government. And, you know, we're a little bit more skeptical of that idea here in the United States. And I think history bears us out in that. Uh, but, you know, it, it is true that AI is going to change our society in ways that, uh, both good and bad, that we are just now beginning to fathom. And, uh, you know, interestingly, when you look at the dangers of AI, uh, one of the main things that I try and communicate to my colleagues who might not be familiar with exactly what we mean when we say AI, you know, what I try and convey is that the biggest danger is not evil robots with red laser eyes, because that's what most people think. They think AI on, oh, it's going to, it's Terminator. They're going to take over the planet. And I have to explain to them, no, actually the biggest danger in AI is that AI is so good at recognizing subtle patterns in massive sets of data that it will can, can expose um, uh, these patterns and influence human behavior in ways that are very subtle. And that has uh, a lot of different implications has implications for privacy because the data that goes that gets fed into these algorithms, you know, that that uh, you know, we we should talk about 
how much of that personal data we ourselves control and how much companies are allowed to exploit that. Um, it, we should talk about political behavior because it, it's possible to influence public opinion using AI algorithms. Uh, and we should talk about sociology, right? We should talk about uh, you know what's going on in Japan where people have these AI enabled pets that they're actually communicating with during the day because they're lonely. You know, like just check it in and how you're going, which you know it blows my mind, but it's true. And if it helps people with their loneliness, is this a good thing for society or a bad thing? Right. So uh, you know, these are these are deep questions. And uh you know, we're really the uh, the US Congress has got to be at the forefront in in leading some of the innovative solutions to answer those questions. Yeah, I mean, this is this is the next revolution, right? We had the information revolution, but I, the way I see it, and I'm wondering if you believe like we're at the, the cusp of a new, a new era in the information revolution um, and AI is, we haven't even gotten to the surface of where this is about to go. And, and chat GPT is one of the, one of the latest hot topics lately uh, around being able to have undetectably uh, AI written content that uh, and, and information that you can ask it lots of stuff and it gives you some pretty good answers. So yeah, it's fascinating you... actually to read those transcripts, isn't it? On, on some of those chat sessions, uh, oh, it gives yeah. you a pretty good, even if you don't have a background in the technology of AI, it just reading those transcripts gives you a pretty good indication of what AI is, what it does, and what its limitations are. But it's, That's right. it, it, you know, it's amazing how, how in depth a conversation that particular system can have. It's, and knowing that it's just on the cert, like right now, we're just touching the surface of this. This is the first piece of AI that is generally accessible to people that they can play with. I think it's one of the few that have made it into lots of people's hands very quickly, and they're starting to see the power very easily. And uh, there, you know, you don't have, there's no paywall behind it, so that makes it easier as well. But it is, it's the beginning. And what do you think, what do you think the implications of this are for government? In, in general, how can, well, let me, let me say, how can the government use things like this to its advantage? And how can we start that? Because there's obviously many benefits. There's obviously some, uh, some detriments, but where do you see the government taking a role in using AI to help uh, its processes, systems, et cetera? Well, if you think about the beneficial uses of AI for a society like ours, uh, it can have an impact that really moves the needle in the right direction on things like human prosperity and poverty and uh, a lot of different uh, problems that we've grappled with as a society for, for thousands of years now. Uh, so, I mean, I think the main thing that, that you have to start with, the main premise is that uh, this is a technology that has, uh, has some dangers and all, but also a technology that has some in, incredible benefits for us. So I think the government needs to approach it with that philosophy, because if we just approach it as Europe is with the philosophy of this is technology, we are government, we must regulate it. You know, we could easily do things that cripple some of the most beneficial uses of the technology that we're trying to empower, right? So, uh, and, and classic, the by the way, it's pretty classic, isn't it? That's like... Well, sure. Yeah, you can exactly. talk about that in a lot of different ways, and and also, you know, appreciate the fact that uh, that government, you know, has its own uh, benefits and drawbacks. And one of the drawbacks of representative government, like the one that we have, is that you've got various special interest groups with their own agendas that are not based on necessarily the progress of society overall, but only the progress of their group. You know, and in particular uh, segments that that represent workforces in different industries. So, you know, if you are, uh, you know, if you're, rep if you're, you know, a member of a workforce and you see AI is threatening your job, you know, you might have some really strong feelings about the fact that no, it's not, it shouldn't be ethical to have an AI physician, for example, that uh, looks at symptoms and can diagnose illnesses. You know, we don't want to see AI read uh, uh, x-rays and diagnose tumors 
you know, we might not want to see AI. If you're a lawyer, you might have concerns about uh, AI written wills, you know, but as a society, you know, when you, when you transition over to the other side and say, no, look, 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 let's look at what's good for society. My goodness. Why would you not as a patient, you know, want you know, an algorithm that you, you know, you, and you, you acknowledge its limitations and you never, you know, could never completely take the place of a human doctor, but, you know, something that you could bounce some stuff off like, Hey, this is what's going on. What might it be rather than spending an hour uh, Googling things, which is, you know, what people do now. So, uh, you know, that, that really makes you grapple with, you know, this ethical issue. And then now, and how much of a responsibility does government have there? Because obviously we want to protect consumers. We want to protect patients. And I, I've just, I'm not picking on doctors, right? I'm just saying this is one of, uh, you know, a thousand different examples that you can pick of, of uh, you know, of, of uh, little industry segments that that AI can enhance, but also imperil, right? So, uh, you know, if you're, if you're a government, you say, okay, we want to protect consumers. So we need to make consumers aware of the limitations of this. We certainly don't want to do something that's harmful. Uh, we might want to take a look at algorithms to make sure they're not giving bad advice. Like, you know, if the, if the a computer physician told you, uh, you know, you've got stage four cancer, you're going to die in a day. That might be very, and it, it ended up being untrue. That might have ended up being very harmful to someone. And even if it were true, uh, maybe that's not the way that ethically a doctor would go about breaking that news, right? The doctor would say, bring your family. we got to have a conversation, make sure they have the support structure to deal with, with, you know, that kind of a, a, a crisis, before you go ahead and reveal that information. So uh, that's that's just layering the complexities that are involved in this decision. But I mean, for us as a government, all, you know, equally wrong, you know, it would be wrong to say, you know, everybody have at it, we're not gonna regulate at all because we have an obligation to protect consumers. But it would also equally be wrong to say, you know what, this has some drawbacks. And so we're going to completely uh, outlaw the technology. Right. So, I mean, th those are two unreasonable extremes and, and we can't take either path. We've got to we've got to forge the center path that tries to make reasonable decisions about what needs to be regulated and what needs and what doesn't need to be. Absolutely. Absolutely. So how it, in that regard, when you see this, for example, affecting our democracy, how can we improve our democracy using AI uh, or does it feel like it's something that would harm it faster than improve it? Well, I mean, I, I, we were talking about AI and the information age, and I actually, uh, uh, I disagree with something you said about how that we're on this inflection point where I think the inflection point was 10 years ago. You know, we're, we're, we've seen this explosion of uh, essentially bandwidth, but what that really means is uh, the abil our ability to connect with, with one another. And it, it has just exploded. And, uh, you know, obviously we've got some good things that came out of it. It's like, hey, I can stream Netflix on my phone. That's great. That's amazing. But some bad things also, some unanticipated things, which has been, for example, the spread of disinformation on social media, uh, the way that foreign government uh, entities have, have attempted to influence uh, democracies all over the world, including ours. And you know we know this goes on and it happens and uh, that's not a good thing. They're they're not especially when there are near peer adversaries. The reason their their reasons for doing that are not benign, right? They they're trying to uh, you know light light the house on fire. So uh, this is not good for us. So how do we deal with this? You know with this issue. And I mean I think a lot of it uh, has it comes around to education. And you know I'm a big believer when it comes to governance. Uh, I would rather educate someone than regulate. Right. I would rather uh, if someone's going to jaywalk across the street instead of sit, sit, sitting a rigid thing that said, OK, no, no, you must wait until the light turns green and then you could go even if it's in the middle of the night, you know, 11 o'clock and no one is within a, a mile of you. You still have to follow the law, you know. Uh, so I but I would rather educate. I would rather say, OK, look, you know, look both ways before crossing. Here are the dangers. You know, it's harder to figure out how far a car away is at night. You know, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, where, where you tell people, you know, you, you help them make those risk avoidance decisions. And I think the same thing is true of our consum consumption of information and our connections to each other. So people need to know the, the dangers of the spread of disinformation. If you see something, I mean, they need to know about confirmation bias. If you see something that seems like tailor-made to 
Uh, oh, of course that's true. Oh my God, I can't believe that they would say that. You know, you really you, you got to have the skeptic in the back of your mind saying, "Is that really true?" Maybe I'm going to spend if I care if it's an issue I care about. Maybe I'm going to spend ten seconds. I'm going to Google it. I'm going to see if this is disinformation. I'm going to see if it's you know really the case. Um, you know that goes to uh, uh, you know to to elections too, right? I mean, we're uh, we've been elections have been contentious in this country since uh, you know since George Washington became president. And it's pretty funny. I just I just got done reading a biography on Thomas Jefferson that just came out a couple of years ago. That's kind of up, you know, an updated look r- retrospectively at his life. And one of the things that I was struck by is that their politics is just as ugly and their partisanism is just as high then as it is now. So all of us, you know, who who want to just uh, uh, you know wave our hands and say it's never been this bad. It actually has. It's always been this bad. You know, but it's more visible now because of our frequent connections to each other. So, you know, when we've got two candidates and they're slinging mud at each other, we need to be wise. We need to say, boy, that's a really simple soundbite. Is that really true? How could that possibly be true? You know, it's and, interesting. And after- it's almost like before you had too much information, sorry, right. too little information, right? You didn't know enough. You didn't get it. You only had this kind of one side of the story. Now there's so much information and disinformation. So there has never been a balance almost uh, in the, in, in, in where, the information is coming from, but also how people are looking at the information. Sure. And I think this is one of the things I, I like to harp on a bit is how do we get people to the source, right? Like I will read the bill or the piece of the bill that is important for what I'm, what I'm researching, but news comes out and maybe, a, you know, there's a bill and then and then there's two sides and you got CNN on one side and Fox on the other side. And, and both are saying one is, one is, you know, this horrific thing. And the other is like, this is the best thing for, but no one knows what the thing is really. And the thing is usually online in the mail. So that is, for example, is source information. There are other people, uh, sources of information what are they where do we get people what do we have to tell people to go do to say when you see this google xyz get to the bill search for the thing or how do we get people to source yeah uh, well it's it's a good question and i actually have an answer it's probably not the only answer but i think it's a good answer and uh, the answer is because most people are too busy with their daily lives to devote the time and energy to figure out what's true and what's not true. We need to leverage the tools that human evolution has given us in that respect. Uh, Humans are social animals. We've evolved this way over millions of years uh, and we are designed to rely on leaders and trusted individuals to guide us. Uh, So, we need trusted sources of information. And, you know, we kind of used to have it when we had the network news and you could go on and see Walter Cronkite. And when Walter said something, I mean, you might not agree with it, but you could be pretty darn sure it was reliably sourced, right? They weren't going to put out some blatant disinformation there. When there was uncertainty, Walter Cronkite would say that there was uncertainty. And that's what we've gotten away from. So uh, I think that what's happened over the last 10 years has exposed the dangers of anonymity, you know, in a lot of different ways. I mean, first of all, anonymity allows you to throw out disinformation without consequence. Uh, But anonymity also, because it kind of separates us from each other, it breaks down those social barriers that keep me from saying to somebody, boy, I really don't like your tie. Would you find that in bargain basement? You know, that's kind of the kind of thing that would never come out of your mouth if you were standing next to somebody but comes out of people's fingers on their keyboards all the time when they're talking to each other on social media. And, you know, psychologists have done studies on this issue and that anonymity is the reason that we lose our human connection. So, I mean, I think part of the solution is, I don't think anonymity should go away. It's got some you know, really important free speech issues with it. And, you know, you've got situations where the emperor has no clothes that people need to be free to say what's on their mind. But there ought to be also kind of trusted forums where anonymity is not allowed. Uh, And you're starting to see that actually spring up in online marketplaces sometimes where people say, look, uh, there's, if you want to be anonymous, there are communities for you, but this is a community where we have to prove who we are before we're allowed to read or post anything. And that way 
you're not going to see people making fun of each other's ties because you know we we have those community those human connections and we're accountable to each other and i think we need more of that because that's going to allow people going to go back to what they used to do where hey i follow this particular person because uh, you know, he follows what Congress is doing. You know, I'm just giving an example, and I trust him. And most of the time, I agree with him. And so, I'm going to follow him. Uh, and and when he says something, I'm going to you know to to assume that more likely than not, it's true. And that frees me from the the obligation of going and sourcing all of that information myself, which none of us have have the time to do. So, I mean, I, I really think that that would be a step in the right direction is for us to get a little bit more wise about that and about the way it influences our online interactions with each other. And this is something that technology can help us determine in real time, right? When you're, and I actually saw, it may have been on Instagram or something where I saw some, uh, something come up and it says, you go check, you can fact check this here. And it brought you to a website that it, it, it detected that there was some information being shared and that you can uh, go do a little bit of deeper research. Yeah, you know what though, it, it's you raise a very interesting point because most of the time, when they've get when social media companies put those 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 uh, contexts, contextual notes on information, it's because someone's yeah. complained this has been misinformation. Ah, you know, and they go in and they check and they say, oh yeah, that's right, it, it lacks context. So if you want more context, you go follow this. But hey. the problem with that is, and this is something Congress is grappling with. You know, the problem with that is it, it really is curation when you do that. And we've got this section of the uh, Federal Communication Code called Section 230, which governs liability for uh, public forum, digital public forums. You know, we used to call them bulletin, you know, bulletin board systems when, you know, back in the early days of modems. But, you know, right now you can understand them as public forums. And, you know, quite early companies like America Online, uh, you know, back when AOL was uh, was a thing, uh, you know, we're saying quite reasonably, hey, look, we we are a uh, a public forum, and so you know, if someone comes and says, uh, you know, Jay Obernolte beats his wife, and you're going to post that up there, we're not responsible for that content, right? That's that's you know, Joe Smith posting that content, and if Jay Obernolte then comes along later and says, I've got a problem with that, he's got to go to Joe Smith. You know, we just post what people say, and uh, Section two thirty you know, creates a liability shield for these companies that says, as long as you are a public forum in that way, then uh, you you have a protection from liability. So, I mean, here's the interesting question. When you start to curate your content, when you start to go through and say, I'm not so sure that's true. You know, I'm going to put a little note on there that says, maybe that's not true. You know, if you didn't curate the post that says, Jay Obernolte beats his wife, does that mean that you're tacitly uh, saying that it, it it is more likely to be true than not true, right? So I mean, this, this is an issue that we're grappling with. Is like, what yeah. is the reliability? And I, that's why I really think that we go down a very slippery slope whenever we expect a company like a Twitter or a Facebook or an Instagram to curate the content that that comes through. I think they they're coming at it with a noble purpose. They want to stop the spread of misinformation, but uh, we all know that misinformation is in the eye of the beholder. And no matter where you draw the line, there are going to be people upset that they were censored or upset that, you know, this person was censored, but this person wasn't. And so you're showing some bias. You know, there's no avoiding that. And so I really think we need to tackle that problem from a different direction. Well, what if it wasn't run, triggered in that way? Let's say it wasn't a human or algorithmic choice to trigger, but rather uh, something that was a consistent caveat on all messaging around that kind of stuff, where where as part of engaging in political dialogue on social media, there are links and sites to help verify. And, and maybe it's not even, I mean, that's just one aspect. Well, maybe the problem is someone would have to create that content, right? Someone would have, someone has to say, oh, this is a post about uh, the bill. We got a bill on the floor today about Puerto Rican statehood. You know, and I wish people had some more context about that because the bill is many pages long and it says a lot more than just Puerto Rico has the right to become a state if they want to, right, without going into detail. So, you know, you might reasonably say if someone says, I can't believe these people are against Puerto Rican statehood, put a little context like, like, well, not really. It's actually the issue is actually much more complicated than that. Right. But someone's got to make that engagement. Just put the bill. Look at that. What's Maybe that? You just put the bill there. 
But, but, I, but, I, but that's what I'm saying. It's someone other than so the post or the person who who posts that who creates that post has you know let's assume they've got some agenda, right? They're they're promoting their political point of view, so they're going to make this post, and so you know someone has to say that lacks context. We're going to give you a link to a dispassionate analysis of what the bill does, but you know someone's got to you know a create the analysis, b decide which analysis is the correct one because you know reasonable minds can differ on that and see you know put the two together and say for more context go here so it's it's just impossible you're never going to be able to do that uh for every single post as much as we might like that to be true and we have news links to the bill as part of their requirements so that when they have these articles about a bill they're required to reference the section of the bill or link to the bill and encourage people to read it. Yeah, I don't know, though. I mean, we go into require, you know, compel. Uh, and I think we just we go to a bad place. It's it's we're never going to come, be able to come up with a full set of, uh, you know, of rules that make people happy. And it just looked at what uh, what, you know, Twitter Twitter was trying to do. You know, they were trying to be, you know, and I, I do believe that uh, their intentions were pure, you know, that they wanted to be a marketplace of ideas, but they wanted to also prevent the spread of disinformation on their platform. And what they found out is you can't, you can't have both of those two things. Those, those two ideas are intention and you really have to pick one or the other. And I think we've got to come down on the side of the free marketplace of ideas, you know, and just, you know, do the bare bones of, look, don't, don't post things about illegal activity, you know, and things that are blatantly against the law anything else is fair game but then you layer that on with uh the ability to to have places where you're not anonymous so that you're accountable for what you post and i think those two things together are the solution to the problem yeah a little bit of both yeah yeah <laughs> you can't blend them yeah well i mean i it's, it's I, I think that uh, i believe in uh you know in freedom and liberty Right. And so I think that it, it's your right to do whatever you want. And if you've got a social media platform that allows total anonymity and allows anyone to post anything that they want, you know, you should be able to, to go look at that. It's a, it, you know, it, it's a free country. Uh, if sure. you want to frequent someone that requires uh, re requires some uh, some accountability and does not allow anonymity at all, that's your choice. If you want yeah. to be a, a platform that curates you know, that, that looks at every post to figure out if it's disinformation or or correct, or maybe even has a rating on every single one. You know, that's what you should be able to do. So, you know, interesting, there's this, this brand new social media technology called Mastodon. Have you heard about this? Uh, I have, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, what I love about Mastodon, I mean, in, in, in addition to the fact that no one, no single person controls it, and it's all open source and distributed, uh, I love the fact that each Mastodon server can set its own social media policies. And, you know, if you don't like the social media policies on this server, well, then don't be a member of that server. Go find another server to be a member of or start your own. So, you know, I just love that. I love that. It really democratizes, you know, th this idea of how we consume information. Sure. So if we're trying to get if we're trying to get the best of both worlds and at the same time want to educate people. Let's look at the last uh, general election in California. I did my research. I spent time figuring out what I wanted to do. I had it was introspective moments. You have to, you have to real if you're going to vote responsibly, it takes time. You have to, and 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 you may have to accept that you're not going to have the outcome you love for putting in that time, but you took the time to understand the issues and do the best you can given the information that 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 is out there. Sure. And there's there's you know handfuls of sites that that do make that easier, but there is a lot of that stuff is not written for most people. Like it's, there are some complex issues and whether or not you need an administrator at a, uh, a dialysis facility, the, the, the intricacies of that are not even for an educated person that's challenging, that's challenging. And to put that into the public hands and get them to vote responsibly on that and take the time, I think is probably unreasonable to expect that of, of people. Um, and but the all the information isn't there necessarily easy enough to 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 absorb uh, and and then we have to make these 
like wild votes about stuff like that. How do we improve that process to get people information uh, more accurately, uh, maybe more precisely, and and help them and guide them with making responsibility uh, responsible choices instead of doing what seems to be at least my experience of what most people do, vote down the line. Mm -hmm. Well, they red, but they vote blue. You don't like you don't like the wokeism in California. You vote red. They're single issue voters. You know you think. Um, you know, you're going to you think that all Republicans are anti-vax, anti-COVID people, you vote blue, like, and they get these extremes, and then people go down the line. How do we fix that? Uh, well, I have an easy solution. And I love the that. solution is exactly <laughs> the same as the solution that we just talked about for social media. You know, you need trusted sources of information, and we already have them. So, you know, if you think that your political party generally gets it right, you can go on your local county party political party website and they will have a complete guide voters guide on the positions that the party has taken on every candidate uh even the ones that aren't in partisan off running for partisan offices like you know city council county supervisor uh, they'll have positions on all the propositions including the local propositions that you know don't get a lot of uh, you know, of, of media attention, because maybe it's just a proposition that's been put on there by your local school board for a bond issuance or something like that. So, you know, they'll they'll have all of that. If you if you, you know, think that political parties, you know, really are, are too politically biased, which, you know, I think is a very reasonable way of looking at it. Well, guess what? There are probably other people in your community, leaders in your community that you agree with that'll, you know, that'll come out with their voting guides. Uh, sometimes they've got you'll get your, you know, your labor union. If you're a member of a union, we'll have a voting guide. Uh, sometimes a chamber of commerce will put out a voting guide. So I'm just saying that, that there are different sources of trusted information that don't require you to invest the time to be an expert on everything on the ballot. And, you know, I think that, I mean, you have to be wise about that too, obviously, because if you go to, you know, if you're going to go to your union, well, obviously, uh, they have a biased opinion, right? Because they're going to be what's best for the union might not be but what, but what might be best for you or best for societies in general. And that's true of any trusted source of information. So, you know, you have to be wise and think about the potential biases that each organization might bring, uh, you know, to the situation, but those tools are already out there. Uh, so, I mean, I, I don't think that that's, uh, you know, that, that that situation is unreasonable. I think it's a good solution. And I also want to acknowledge though, that, that I don't think casting an informed vote on every issue on a ballot takes that much time. You know, the the uh, state of California and each individual county will put out these voting guides that give you a pretty good idea. I mean, like the state propositions, which are at the front of the voter handbook every election, uh, they'll go through each proposition. And there's an argument in support and an argument against. And if you want to get into the weeds, there's a rebuttal to the argument in support and a rebuttal of the argument against. Uh, and, you know, you can it's in 30 seconds, you just go down and you're like, oh, I got it. You know, dialysis. The labor unions want to require more people there, uh, but that's going to raise costs for the patients. Okay, and that means fewer dialysis clinics and higher prices if you have diabetes or if you have a, if you need dialysis. Okay, well there you go. You know you've got the crux of the argument right there. Do you think that um, you know everyone should be forced to pay more for dialysis to increase safety, or do you think that uh, the safety is is being adequately managed and uh, and do you fear pricing people out of the care that they need? Right. So, I mean, any, any, anyone can understand that. That's just one issue. You can go through them pretty darn quickly. And uh, I don't think it takes more than a couple of hours to make an informed decision on a, on every issue on a ballot. And we only have to do it, what, on average, uh, two elections every two years, the primary and the general, uh, every other year. So on average, you have to give a couple hours of your life once a year to be to cast an informed vote and participate in our democratic society. I don't think that that's too much to ask. Do you think, but do you think that if you're looking at an IQ spectrum or intelligence spectrum, do you think that the boiling down, reading that that quickly and boiling it down to a 30, you know, uh, a 30 second explanation like you did so precisely and, and, and eloquently? Uh, and, and well, one, I guess one could argue, are those the only things? I mean, I could probably ask questions on that, but let's just say that was the crux. What you did was just really um, nail the, the the crux of the issue. Can people do that like you just did? That was, that was you know, that's, 
you're you're a smart guy. You understand the issues. What about people who are not familiar with politics, don't have the education, maybe aren't as uh, intellectually savvy, uh, or have a, a high IQ? I mean, half of the population has an IQ of less than a hundred. You know, I'm I'm a human optimist, and I don't believe uh, w- w- the premise of what you just said. Uh, I don't believe that the average person lacks the tools to be able to look at an issue like that. You just you have to be open minded. You get faster at it. I talk to a lot of high school groups and I, about voting, about uh, the the importance of voting. You know, I, and what I tell them is, look, you have to register to vote. The moment you turn 18, you can pre-register in California that, that makes you automatically registered when you turn 18 and make a personal commitment to vote in every single election your entire life. Because if you don't do that, you have no right to complain about the way that things are if you're not willing to invest the small amount of time necessary to create change. Right. But if, if and what I tell them, though, is, is and, and we walk through how to do it. You know, you go to a candidate, you know, an office and you've got you know two candidates running. Uh, where, you know, they'll have a statement in the voter guide. You read one statement, you read the other statement. If you want more information, you go to their website. Uh, you know, almost 100% certainty they have one. Their positions will be there. And so we walk through, you know, how to make, how, how to vote, how to make an informed decision on the ballot. And what I, one of the things I tell them is it gets easier. Once you, you know, d- don't despair. You know, it might take you a few hours the first time you do it to work your way through the ballot, but you'll get quicker at it next time because there'll be issues that you've seen before. I mean, the dialysis one, this is what their third attempt to do this. The uh, the dialysis unions, you know, I like keep going back, which is crazy because it costs millions of dollars to qualify these things. But, uh, you know, they keep coming back uh, uh, with the same uh, the same initiative. So, you you know, you've seen that issue before and you're like, oh, OK, here we go again with dialysis. Right. So uh, but but I believe <laughs> it's like every, every two years we're voting on dialysis. That's right. Yeah, that's the way it goes. So but but I mean, so you get you get faster at doing it. But I do believe that the average person has the tools for that. And again, if you don't want to take the time, find yourself a trusted source of information, you know, being wise about potential biases, being wise about the fact that as you uh, age and mature, that maybe your trusted sources will change. You know, because, you know, and, and you know, being wise about if you find a reason not to trust a source of information, you know, that you need to go find some other one. You know, if that's what you need to do, then do that. Uh, but yeah. but that doesn't mean you didn't cast an informed vote. Sure. I appreciate that optimism, actually. I and 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 I don't disagree. Um, I think I think and it's important to empower all people to be able to make an informed vote. I guess my. My hesitation in doing it myself is I don't know if all those links or all that education of how to do that is necessarily there. And from what I see, people vote down the line. They're asking friends for who they're voting for. You know, no one knows how to vote for a judge. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. You know, yeah, no one does. That That's we, we should really rethink that because it's very difficult when you've got I, I think my ballot had 13 judges on it this time. And like, how do you how do you parse that? Well, and also are people look. Should people be voting for a sheriff? I like the idea of it, but like I don't know if I'm qualified to to if to hire a sheriff. Mm-hmm. Right? Well, if I, it's might hard to hire. Important. Sorry, it might be more important now than uh, than at any other time, right? Because uh, the philosophy of law enforcement has been called into question. So, I mean, really, do you want a sheriff that believes that uh, uh, that? Uh, we, as a society, we over incarcerate and that lower level crimes should be, uh, you know, that it should be a slap on the wrist and that people deserve a lot of second chances before, uh, before they get put in a situation that could affect the rest of their lives. Or do you believe uh, that, you know, we've gotten too lax as a society, look at all this crime and, and you're going to have no tolerance for property crime and, you know, believe that, that uh, you know, we should be more sympathetic to victims. And, you know, so that that's, that's like, a total dichotomy, you know, why should people not be able to weigh in on that when where you are in that philosophical spectrum is so important? Well, it gets into the idea of we're voting on dialysis machines, but we're not necessarily voting on some of the most important issues that affect our state, Mm -hmm. right? You're voting on a sheriff, but are you voting on the the laws that regulate uh, how people are arrested? Are you voting sure. on the laws, right? So, no, like, but but this is yeah. what representative government is, right? No, you aren't. We are. I mean, not anymore. I used to serve in state the government, as you as you probably know, um, you know. But that's uh, that's a responsibility we take very seriously, and we try to educate our 
uh, our constituents on those issues and why we make the decisions that we make. But that's, uh, you know, that's why we have representative government is so that people don't have to worry about that. You worry about it. We, we all, it's almost like we, we were just talking about, right? Trusted sources of information. I mean, in a sense, your representative is your trusted uh, source of action on these issues. And if you don't agree with my philosophy on those issues, then you need to vote for somebody else whose views are more closely aligned with yours, which is kind of where the political parties come in. But uh, I agree with you. Uh, and you haven't gone as far as I would go in saying, I think the political parties uh, have become a terrible thing for our country. Uh, you know, the, the problem is when you've got a majoritarian government like the one that we have, uh, where one party is in charge and the other party's in the minority, the party that's in the minority always has the, the job number one is going to be to sling mud at the party in the majority, right? Until they become the party in the majority. And then the party that they displaced is going to spend the next few years slinging mud at them. You know, you, you completely lose this idea that we're supposed to be on the same team, even if we disagree on individual issues, you know, you don't, and it doesn't feel that way. And unfortunately, the, the spread of media, you know, the, this ubiquitous spread of, of our connections to each other have exacerbated this situation, you know, you know because you, you, can't, you can't turn on the news without seeing one political party bash the other, because that's what political parties do. So, I mean, I really think that we have to sit down kind of as a society and have a discussion about whether or not this is healthy. I just experienced this at the local level, too, in Santa Monica. Like, the amount of smearing mm. is... Of your neighbors, you're smearing your neighbors because one thinks uh, housing is the only answer, and the other thinks it's a balanced approach, or maybe there's more mental illness associated to homelessness, the homelessness crisis, like and and where the data comes from, and and they and and I mean they really demonize good people who are getting involved in their government because they love Santa Monica, mm -hmm. and and this at the local level, and is. I mean, it was really disheartening to see. And some oh, of these yeah, are I completely agree. And you know what? Think about the, the, you, were the last mayor, Big, you were a mayor of Big Bear too, right? So yeah, before I, I served in uh, local so government, I started out on airport board of directors. Yeah. Um, think about, you know, the, talking about like homelessness, which is a complex issue. And yet the people that have a political motive always, uh, it's always in their best interest to boil it down into something that, that, uh, makes the issue seem much simpler than it is. You know, for example, you know, you're seeing a lot of people that say now, hey, this having homeless encampments, you know, in the middle of the public square is not a healthy thing for us. You know, this is not good. And, you know, the, 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 that gets boiled down to the talk by, well, you just, why do you, why do you hate homeless people so much, Evan? You know what, what, what? You know what? Right? I can't believe you're so heartless. And you're like, no, no, right. it's a complicated issue. It's you know, it has its roots in in mental health. It has its roots in uh, you know, in uh, the uh, uh, substance abuse. Uh, it has its roots in uh, you know how much control we have. Or you know, we are wanting to have some control and not wanting to go sleep in a shelter. All of those things put together in this complicated mix. And so, for for any of the two people that are on opposite sides of that issue. To trivialize it is a terrible thing. And yet that's what political parties specialize in doing, because their number one goal is not to solve any of these individual issues. It's to to uh, to trash the other party. <laughs> so right. it's, it's just not a How is California thing. on this spectrum. Obviously, federal, it seems horrific. Uh, I, you know, it is it does feel that, you know, California Republicans and Democrats are not like West Virginia Democrats and Republicans, right? Uh, you're on energy and natural resource mm. environmental committees, right? You, 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 it seems like a lot of the values are here are the same, even though maybe there's differences on some of the some of the bigger issues, whether it's free speech or guns or abortion or whatever. Um, but it does feel like there, it, it, like there's a little bit of a closer net in California. Is that is that true? Do you feel that? Um, is oh. California a better example of Better. I didn't say great. So I, I am curious to know your thoughts on on how California pair is in, in, in that way. Well, uh, I will give you a perspective that you probably won't hear from a lot of people. Uh, I think that uh, having served in the California legislature for three terms and now starting my second term in Congress, 
I can tell you with 100% certainty that it is much more collegial in California and much less partisan in California than in Congress. And uh, that really shocked me when I first got to, to Congress, because uh, I expected the opposite, because, you know, we've got that super majority and, and uh, Republicans are outnumbered by such a large num amount in in uh, in Sacramento and in California as a whole. But uh, here's the perspective I've come to realize is, uh, first of all, the uh, what helps us in California is, is that balance of power. So because the balance is so much more narrow in Congress, the parties have to beat the, the partisan drum much louder and much more often to get everyone, you know, in lockstep in the same direction. Uh, and because the balance can shift from one election to another, you know, where the balance doesn't shift very much. I mean, look what just happened in the midterms. You know, the, the Democrats were in power by five seats, and now the Republicans are in power, you know, in, in January. The Republicans will be power in the House of Representatives by five seats. But so that's a 10 sweet swing out of 400. That's tiny. And yet everything in the House is going to change because it's a majoritarian in institution. And whoever has the majority controls all of the levers of power. So because of that, you know, that that makes it more partisan because one, you know, the in California, the Democratic Party, they might lose a few seats, they might gain a few seats. They're not worried about being out of power. So that's thing number one. Thing number two is think about this. We've got 435 members of the House and 100 members of the Senate, 535 people. In California, we only have 80 members of the Assembly and 40 members of the Senate, 104, 120 people. So when I served in the legislature, I had a personal relationship with every single other member that I served with. And uh, part of it is because I made it my business to do so. I think we're in the relationship business. Uh, and not everyone does that. But I mean, it's possible. If you put your mind to it over a course of a couple of years, you can establish relationships with 100, 120 different people. And that makes all the difference in the world, because when you're up when you're up standing on the floor debating a bill, you're a lot less likely to say, oh, and by the way, the other guy's an idiot. Right. If you know them, if you just had dinner with them the last week, if you know their wife and their kids, you know, you'll say you'll talk about issues and you'll, you'll not not with any less passion, but it makes it a lot less partisan a lot less personal. Whereas in Congress, it's hopeless. You know, you can't, uh, I, I don't yet, I've been working at it two years now. Um, I, I'm, I'm further along than I thought I'd be, but I don't yet even have a personal relationship with all the members of the Republican conference just in the House, you know, because there's, you know, 222 of us. So, so yeah, that's that, do you think it's because people didn't, um, sorry, the, the congressmen don't live in the same area that it wasn't there something that happened a, a couple decades ago where they didn't require everyone to live in DC. And if when everyone was living in DC, there was it was a bit more um yeah a new Newbrick is who started that and, and he said and not without some justification he said uh look we we come to DC to get the people's work done but then you need to go all, you all need to go back to your districts because that's where the job is you're 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 a member of representative government you need to go talk to the people that you represent and i i appreciate that philosophy and i agree with it a lot of it but the consequence of that was you know before that most members of congress when they were elected would move their families to DC because i mean especially if you have kids you've got to make this decision where do you put your kids in school you know, and wh where your kids are in school, that's going to determine where you spend the majority of your time. So you're spending your time in D.C. going back to your district once in a while. You're spending your time in district going back to D.C. once in a while. When that equation changed, uh, then the social ties between members of Congress became uh, a lot less personal. And uh, I would actually like to see not talk about, you know, where people live, but uh, in terms of socialization, I would like to see us go back to the way Congress used to be, where uh, more of us knew each other and knew each other's families. And I think that that sets the stage for a lot more bipartisan cooperation. Absolutely. On a lot of you get coffee with somebody, even if your family's had a Zoom call. Yeah. Like you, 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 if, if that was the intention and part of even the, the uh, I don't know, the MO of, of when you sign up for that role, and you're less likely to smear someone you know, like exactly. like you said, you don't, and, and and you gain an appreciation for their perspective when you realize your kids both play soccer mm -hmm. on the same team, or um, or they both play the saxophone, or you both love to cook, 
you didn't realize that your favorite dish is chicken parmesan that's probably mine but um how do we make that happen i mean you just you just named a really good solution to translate some of this stuff from how you do things in california to federal government is there a possibility of helping people stop this hating on one another i i i think there is and i'm an optimist and all, you know, my wife will tell you I'm an optimist on on lots of things, uh, many of which I shouldn't be an optimist on. But on this, I'm definitely an optimist. You know, I, there are uh, a lot of people who believe, as I do, that uh, that relationships are the key to working together as a legislative body. Uh, who value diversity, not just diversity of you know skin color, ethnicity, but diversity of background, diversity of political opinion, diversity of thought. Uh, and that we should seek out that diversity and uh, you know, the, the most valuable relationships we have are with the people who are least like us, because those are the people that can provide us with the best source of information that we don't already know. So uh, I think more and more of us believe that in Congress. And I really hope that in the years to come, we can stop this reckless swinging towards antagonism and partisanism. Uh, and start remembering that we're supposed to serve on the same team, even if we disagree on uh, on individual issues. Yeah. Well, maybe maybe we have to do like a tag you're it, and you got to go and like call the person you'd least likely to call and get on a family Zoom call with them, and then they have to go do that to somebody else, and we have to go do a uh, a tag you're it around Congress and get everyone to know each other more personally. Well, I mean, you know, you know sometimes they've got these games to break the ice in groups of people. You know, maybe we need to do more of that. <laughs> like, but uh, actually, so one of the things that I did when I was in Sacramento that uh, we are doing uh, again in Congress are what we call bipartisan dinners, where we just get to get together small groups of people from uh, opposite sides of the aisle. Uh, we get them together for dinner, uh, with people who don't know each other. And, you know, we just kind of explore. It's totally unguided. We just talk about, you know, family. We talk about hobbies. We talk about, uh, you know, all the things in our lives. And it's amazing what arises that we all have in common. I mean, things you would never guess. Yeah, it is. And what you, you know, I always found that, and, and this is one of the things I was discussing with um, Pete Peterson, who's the Dean of Public Policy at Pepperdine. And if you don't, if you don't challenge your perspective, you actually can't learn very well because right. learning happens when 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 you have to test where you are with new information and 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 take that in and say, yep, I believe it, or yes, I don't, or wow, that's interesting. But if you don't do that and you don't challenge yourself in anything, basketball, math, it doesn't matter. You learn through challenging yourself in right. some way, shape, or form, especially when it comes to politics or your beliefs on things that are important. It doesn't mean you have to shift your belief, but it does mean that you, that's right. If you want to be civil, you got to respect the way that other people think about it too. And you'll actually learn something. Yep. Yeah. I think that's true too. And on that note, I'm uh, being told I have to go vote on ah, state of Puerto Rico, but, uh, but I have really enjoyed our conversation, Evan. Thank you very much for the invitation and we'll have to do it again sometime. Uh, uh, me as well. Good luck out there and uh, I'll see you soon. Thanks for everything you do. Okay. Thanks, Evan. Take care. Merry Christmas. You too.